75 years ago, 12 countries signed the North Atlantic Treaty in Washington, D.C. to ensure their collective defense in an unpredictable world. This year, 32 NATO allies have gathered in the same city to make key decisions on how to continue to protect their country. And as the world faces the most dangerous security environment since the Cold War era, NATO is pushing to expand cooperation with partners in the Indo-Pacific, which led President Yoon Song Yeol to attend the NATO summit for the third straight time. In this edition of Within the Frame, we explore the summit's top agendas, significance of South Korea's participation, and NATO's growing security challenges. To help us navigate through the complexities, we have Dr. Ko Myung Hyun from the Institute for National Security Strategy joining us in the studio. It's always great to have you with us. Thanks for having me. And joining us from Washington, D.C., where the NATO summit is taking place, is VOA correspondent Jessica Stone. It's a pleasure to have you on our show. Good evening. All right, Jessica, let's start off with you. First, help our viewers get a clearer picture of this year's NATO summit. Who is participating and what are the key topics on the agenda? So as you mentioned in the lead up, uh, 32 countries from around Europe are participating as well as four Indo-Pacific partners. Those are Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, and VOA recently spoke to uh, former ambassador Daniel Friedman who pointed out that South Korea is really key to the uh, activities of uh, NATO right now, particularly with respect to Ukraine and countering Russia's aggression there. Uh, the goals of this, uh, uh, entire uh, effort are to deter, uh, to increase defense and to deter aggression, not only in Europe, but also um, to, to a, a smaller extent within China and within North Korea. Uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the D director general, told VOA in a reporter roundtable that NATO plans to boost Ukraine security through a five-step plan, and he laid that out. He said, we're going to create a command, uh, commanded uh, out of Germany, that will um, basically be similar to the effort that NATO co constructed in Afghanistan, where the command and control comes from Germany under NATO's auspices. A three-star general would be assigned. They're also going to discuss uh, additional financial aid, uh, the, uh, the baseline of which is 40 billion euros a year uh, from NATO. And they've already announced that uh, they're sending at least five Patriot missile batteries uh, to uh, Ukraine, as well as additional uh, tactical defense, uh, air defenses. They're really focusing on air defenses. And this um, this agreement is also going, this five-step plan, I should say, is also going to focus on bilateral security agreements with each of NATO members with Ukraine, as well as interoperability, so that NATO and Ukraine's forces become increasingly interoperable. Uh, we do also expect them to talk about, but not execute completely, on Ukraine's uh, membership application to NATO. And so that will also be a focus of the conference. Uh, and of course, it's taking place uh, against the backdrop of the U.S. election and of the reticence of Republican lawmakers in particular to send more aid and more arms to Ukraine, arguing that this war is uh, not winnable at this point and that it is uh, just prolonging without overwhelming force what's going on over there in Ukraine. So assistance to Ukraine, deterring security challenges and also expanding partnerships with Indo-Pacific nations will likely take center stage along with other mm -hmm. issues. Dr. Ko, this year's NATO summit holds all the more importance mm -hmm. as uh, it, it'll mark 75 years since its founding. And it also comes uh, at a time when the world is faced with a myriad of uncertainties like uh, former U.S. President Trump's mm -hmm. possible comeback and the, the, the turbulent political shifts mm. in Europe. Uh, tell us more about the significance of the NATO summit taking place at a critical time. Yeah, this is a parado paradoxical moment uh, for NATO to have this summit because NATO is at the height of uh, its glory, so to speak, because he added a new member this year, the 32nd member being Sweden. Uh, Sweden, as we all know, uh, has long been a neutral country in Europe, uh, but then they essentially gave a stamp of approval to NATO by joining uh, the organization. So in that sense, uh, it has demonstrated that 
NATO is very much uh, effective and also very, also, I would say, uh, very much an important player right now in the international security. But uh, paradoxically, it's facing ch uh, challenges from within. Uh, you mentioned about the potential return of the former President Donald Trump to the White House, who has long been critical of NATO, and also uh, the, uh, the rise of the far right in the European political scene, who uh, want to essentially settle, have a reach some sort of a settlement in Russia to finish the war, because uh, not so much because the Europe not just in Europe is exposed to the security risk coming from uh, Russia, but also they're exposed to the economic crisis uh, that was caused by the ongoing war in Ukraine. So, so these are the dual challenges uh, that the NATO faces while NATO is still very much effective. So I think uh, what the NATO leaders are going to say is uh, essentially an announcement of the Europeanization of NATO. So for a long time, NATO has been essentially uh, uh, supported by the, the single effort of the United States. Uh, but then uh, with the specter of a uh, you know, major critic of NATO, Donald Trump um, possibly returning to the White House, uh, then NATO member countries will have to contend with two things. One is, as Jessica mentioned, about the uh, uh, more active role by the European members of NATO to help Ukraine win this war against Russia. But also there's the issue that's going to be uh, mentioned over and over throughout uh, uh, for the rest of this year until at least the November elections in the United States will be how much of a burden the European members of NATO are going to uh, bear from going forward. Uh, President Trump uh, uh, had a famous to mention about the 2% uh, threshold of a GDP spend, uh, defense spending on GDP. Uh, so the GDP spending on defense. And so but then there are still member states in NATO who haven't reached that uh, level. So they have to really uh, do a great job, better job in uh, uh, in increasing their spending and to make sure that uh, there's a fair burden sharing. So I think these kind of issues are going to be discussed at uh, this time, in addition to rise of China, uh, also the, uh, the more cooperation with uh, Asia-Pacific Asia like-minded states, uh, such as New Zealand, Australia, Korea, and Japan, which are going to be uh, uh, given a different moniker this time, uh, from Asia-Pacific forward to Indo-Pacific forward. So it will be quite interesting <laughs> and quite a, a critical moment. NATO faces uh, perhaps the most turbulent time since mm. its founding, but some experts also point out that it could be an opportunity mm. for the alliance to boost solidarity mm. and address their weaknesses, uh, which you've touched mm. upon briefly. And in a related question, Jessica, President Biden's debate crisis is overshadowing the NATO summit as Trump looms large. Reports indicate that concerns are growing among NATO members, with some calling for the need to reduce NATO's reliance on the U.S. as Trump's return to the White House could mean a dramatic cut in U.S. aid to Ukraine and NATO's other uh, defense costs as well. What are you hearing about this? Well, I think it's important to remember that Trump's main objection to NATO was this 2 percent of GDP contribution by its members. And as Dr. Gok uh, commented, not everyone is there, but many more countries have reached that goal and even surpassed it. Uh, than prior to the Trump administration. And that does not mean that Europe is not concerned, as you laid out, uh, about the future of NATO, and rightly so, because we know that Trump's uh, foreign policy is very different than Joe Biden's foreign policy. And in particular, when it comes to Ukraine, it's very likely that he would deal with uh, that conflict differently. In fact, his former national security aides have released a, quote, peace plan uh, that they propose that the U.S. engage in, which basically uh, demands that aid to Ukraine from the United States be contingent on Ukraine agreeing to a ceasefire plan uh, and a negotiated settlement with Russia. And the plan also lifts some Russian sanctions uh, and delays Ukraine's effort to join NATO in exchange for engaging in that process. But it's also important to remember that U.S. lawmakers have passed a law that uh, prevents the United States from withdrawing from NATO. So there isn't the capacity of the U.S. president as there was uh, under the former Trump presidency to withdraw from deals. Uh, we saw him uh, withdraw from many deals, including the Paris Climate Accords, uh, the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, legislation now prevents him from doing so with withdraw withdrawing from NATO without two-thirds Senate approval. So that's a tough barrier to overcome and at least put some barriers on what he can do with respect to NATO.
Trump's return will not only affect the budgetary and other operations within NATO, but also in peace talks in Ukraine, right, which is another point of concern. He's widely expected yeah. to increase pressure on Ukraine to concede to Russian demands, which could be a major security concern, not only for Ukraine, but for many other countries, including South Korea. Dr. Goh, considerable focus will, of course, be placed on NATO's aid mm -hmm. for Ukraine, and we're expecting a new initiative to be unveiled, which is called the NATO Security Assistance and Training mm -hmm. for Ukraine. Uh, and on top of that, of course, we're expecting additional financial support and more military hardware mm -hmm. as well. Could you elaborate on NATO's planned uh, aid package for Ukraine and also your thoughts on them. So it is all about, about the structure, I would say the, form, uh, the format of uh, how to help your, uh, Ukraine uh, in terms of uh, organizational structure. So even before the United States was taking the lead, especially through the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, uh, and, and then this time around uh, with the new organization, I think it's called the NATO Security Assistance and Training. Uh, uh, coordination group. Uh, with that new organization, I, I think uh, essentially the message is that uh, NATO, the European members of NATO are going to take the lead uh, more so than before. And I think Jessica again had uh, described uh, what are, the, uh, did, uh, what are the, the concrete projects and initiatives that are uh, being elaborated and put on the table and will be announced in this summit. Uh, so overall, it's more about uh, front-loading the assistance, I would say, to Ukraine before political changes take place place in Washington uh, mm -hmm. next year. So if it doesn't happen, then when, uh, NATO and the United States are going to continue with the current format. But if there's a political change and if that leads to uh, a, essentially a decrease in the international community's assistance to Ukraine, then it's likely that in order to prevent any kind of a, uh, uh, essentially a, uh, negative consequences for the defense of Ukraine, uh, the allies and partners would like to front load the assistance this year. So even though uh, it was announced that the European uh, members of the NATO are going to ensure that at least there will be uh, 40 billion euros of uh, f uh, assistance uh, to Ukraine every year, that's not guaranteed by any means. So it's likely that they will put this, uh, the bulk of the assistance uh, before the election takes place uh, this year. And then, uh, so and the, the NATO members and also as Ukraine are in a hurry. Well, essentially, they are running against the clock in this case. Reports say that NATO will unveil, <coughs> quote unquote, historic aid package for Ukraine, but whether that's enough is mm. another big mm. question. Jessica, Russia is a primary threat to NATO allies, and growing North Korea-Russia arms cooperation has become a big problem for the alliance. Would this mm -hmm. issue become a critical point of discussion at the summit, and what message do you anticipate from NATO members about this? Yeah, it already is a big talking point and a big source of discussion in Washington uh, and in the context of the NATO uh, summit here. A NATO official telling reporters earlier this week that the North Korean arms that are so important to Moscow, uh, it, it just shows how important they are because we saw, of course, Vladimir Putin visit North Korea uh, in a in a uh, in a uh, an effort to continue that relationship and, and obviously sealed additional deals uh, to perpetuate that relationship. Washington and Seoul estimate now that North Korea has sent 10,000 containers of arms to Russia. And that is a huge problem for NATO because its purpose is to deter war through increased defense. And it perceives that there is a threat from North Korea directly because it perceives that it's fueling the war in Europe. Uh, and NATO problem, the NATO problem escalates if we see continued evidence of cooperation with respect to sending North Korean troops to Russia. We already saw that visit this week uh, of the uh, military education uh, members uh, from North Korea delegation going uh, to Russia. Uh, and then also we saw the Pentagon spokesperson on June 25th say that Washington is watching this aspect of North Korea-Russia uh, cooperation and has warned uh, against uh, continuing that. Um, we also have seen Chinese involvement uh, with respect to how NATO is increasingly cooperating with um, p with countries in, in the Indo-Pacific. And the Chinese spokesperson saying this week that NATO should stick to Europe and that its involvement in Asia will only increase instability. Uh, so yes, this is a huge conversation uh, and we do expect more progress to be made during the summit.
As President Yoon has said, North Korea-Russia military ties post a distinct threat and a grave challenge to the peace and security, not only on the Korean Peninsula, uh, but to Europe as well. So a lot of discussions are expected to take place about that issue during the three-day summit. Now, Dr. Go, boosting partnership with four Indo-Pacific countries, dubbed the IP4, uh, namely South Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, will also be another focal point of the summit. Do you expect more specific and concrete ways to further strengthen their partnership and also help us understand the importance of Indo-Pacific to NATO? And vice versa, obviously. Uh, so I think that, I mean, the most important change here is the change of the name of the group, the Asia Pacific uh, Partners of NATO. The grouping's name has changed from AP4 to IP4 to further identify the linkage between NATO and the Indo Pacific region. And clearly, the, in the term Indo Pacific is uh, quite charged, has a lot of implications. And uh, the, one of the main implications of uh, significance of the uh, Indo-Pacific region is that uh, it, it has an implication about uh, geopolitical uh, competition between uh, China and the United States. Uh, this is the reason why China is very critical of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy and the change of the moniker from AP4 to IP4 uh, probably further irritates the Chinese uh, because, uh, you know, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy being further identified with NATO is likely to uh, essentially, um, I would say, elicit a negative reaction from China. So, but then we have to make, sh uh, uh, make it very clear that, that this, this doesn't represent uh, NATO expansion to the Indo-Pacific region. For instance, uh, there are member states in NATO uh, uh, that are very adamantly opposed to the idea of a NATO expansion to the, this part of the world, uh, namely France. And the reason is very simple. I mean, they don't want NATO to be seen as an anti-Chinese grouping uh, because there are still areas of cooperation uh, between China and the global West, so to speak. So there's that issue. And then, but then at the same time, uh, we have to understand that uh, the security challenges of today are increasingly uh, borderless. So they are interconnected, and so oftentimes we tend to, especially in Asia, we tend to believe uh, Europe is far away from us. But then, the, as we have seen with uh, the recent signing of the defense treaty between Russia and North Korea, we are extremely connected now, and that's the reason why we need to create uh, a broader coalition uh, so that we can <laughs> confront uh, this kind of challenges together. So I think uh, this is going to be the central message of the NATO summit, and it's not a coincidence that. Uh, the, the General Secretary Jan Stoltenberg mentioned, and uh, also uh, others, the, the former ambassador of NATO, uh, Dan Fried, mentioned that uh, South Korea is going to be a very important uh, member, uh, not member, but a participant in this summit in Washington. It's because uh, it's essentially it's being said in the context of the recent signing of the mutual defense treaty between Moscow and Pyongyang. So South Korea has become more vulnerable to Russian threats. But at the same time, South Korea is unique in the sense that it's a world position to change its situation by helping itself, but by helping the European members of NATO with the military assistance and other tools of support. So I think it's going to be very interesting what South Korea says in this summit. NATO will welcome Sweden this week, which will participate in the NATO Leaders Summit for the first time as the alliance's 32nd member. What about the issue of Ukraine's NATO membership. Would anything about the path toward Ukraine's membership be discussed or included in the joint communique? And Jessica, what is Washington's stance on the matter? So there's two words circulating around Washington with respect to that question. The first word is bridge. The uh, Trump proofing of the NATO alliance uh, really has to do with providing a bridge to Ukraine, not uh, warding this summit uh, during this summit or voting this summit to uh, to uh, bring Ukraine into the alliance, but building a bridge uh, that is, and here's the other word, irreversible, giving Ukraine an irreversible path uh, to uh, membership. And so the bridge is all of these five step, parts of this five step plan, um, building infrastructure, uh, creating this command, uh, uh, creating these financial commitments, interoperability, et cetera, and then, uh, within the context of the communique, there are reports specifically from Politico where they will lay out a, quote, irreversible path for Ukraine so that even uh, if we have a change in leadership of the U.S. government, that Ukraine will still be on a path to membership in 
uh, in NATO. And Jens Stoltenberg told reporters on Sunday that they're really uh, finessing the language around this because language, he says, is very important. It's important that it make it clear that Ukraine will join NATO. Uh, we also know that a senior NATO official told reporters as well that there will be a path laid out to what they call bridged membership of Ukraine. So again, that word bridge and, uh, and um, irreversible. And this includes all of the steps that they're going to announce this time. We don't have a timeline for Ukraine uh, membership in NATO, but there has been uh, one comment from Jens Stoltenberg where he said he thinks it will happen in the next 10 years. And uh, our final question is for you, Dr. Go. Uh, much attention was also drawn to whether <clears throat> leaders of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan will uh, gather <clears throat> on the sidelines. Uh, but that looks quite murky for now. Mm -hmm. What's your projection on this? And also, what sort of outcome do you expect from the Yun Kishida summit that's expected to be held? Well, this is the nature of the, the sideline meetings that, uh, that accompanies this kind of major summit that brings together the leaders of uh, many different countries. So it's uh, oftentimes ad hoc, uh, takes place in the, at the convenience of their leaders well, uh, and depends on their availabilities. So it doesn't, just because there's a sideline meeting not taking place, it doesn't mean that uh, there's no essential uh, diplomatic failure of any sort or there's a tension between any of these given two countries or three countries in case of a trilat. So uh, I wouldn't really attribute too much meaning to it, but then it's also possible that, that there could be a major uh, decision being announced through this kind of bilat or trilat uh, that takes place on the sidelines. So one, uh, I think that all the eyes are focused on the possibility of the trilateral meeting between South Korea, United States, and Japan, and but the, and then also between the bilat between Korea and Japan, or because of the recent signing of the mutual defense treaty between Russia and North Korea. Uh, so all the eyes, and I think uh, it's on the South Korean President Yoon suk yeol because on the eve of his visit to Washington for the NATO summit meeting, he, uh, announced, he essentially uh, issued a statement saying that, uh, uh, implying, implying that South Korea uh, could finally uh, initiate, start uh, supplying Ukraine with little uh, military aid. And uh, the Russians obviously criticized him for that. And so, and then the backdrop of the Washington will be perfect occasion and place uh, for President Yoon to announce such a major policy shift, which is very much uh, awaited by South Korea's allies for a very long time. So we'll, we'll have to see whether that happens or not. All right, we'll uh, keep close tabs on how things will unfold on that front until Thursday, which is when the summit will wrap up. Thank you so much, Dr. Go, as always, for your perspectives. Always my pleasure. And many thanks to you as well, Jessica, for your brilliant reporting. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of this show. Thank you for watching and be sure to tune in same time tomorrow to join our conversation. Goodbye for now.